Bob Larson is the world's foremost authority on the occult, demons, and the supernatural. You've seen him on Larry King Live, The O'Reilly Factor, Politically Incorrect, Oprah, and other network programs. He has traveled to 80 countries and has written 30 best-selling books, translated into a dozen languages. Today, you'll discover how to overcome spiritual bondage and become the person God meant you to be. Now, prepare yourself to receive spiritual freedom. I want to talk to you this afternoon about the kinds of authority. Authority is not just authority. There are several different kinds of authority. We're also going to talk about the concept of limited and unlimited authority. And when we say authority, we tend to think of it in an absolute sense. But there are variations. And understanding what those variations are will help you to walk in the authority that you need. There are basically four kinds of authority. The first kind of authority is earned authority. Earned authority means that your actions or your conduct place you in a position of acceptability for having that authority. What would be an example of earned authority? The military, for example. Anything that you do that allows you to have the right to exercise that authority. Now is that the kind of authority, such as in military command, that we're talking about with reference to the kingdom of God? And the answer is no. Then there is acquired authority. Now acquired authority is different. Earned authority means that by performance, by standard, by proof, you indicate that you are worthy. Acquired authority means you buy it. You go out, you get it. Let me give you an example of that. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts, the 8th chapter. Beginning in verse 17. And when they had laid hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. And Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. And he offered them money. He said, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. That's an example of an attempt to get it. There's another rather interesting attempt that is found in the book of Acts, the 19th chapter. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Well, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. God's got a sense of humor, doesn't he? ha. <laughs> I guess a few naked exorcists running around would put the fear of God into people, wouldn't it? <laughs> In both of these cases, they tried to acquire power. Now, you can get authority and power through acquisition. 
I don't know if any of you know, but the current mayor of New York City basically bought the office. Now, he did get Giuliani's endorsement, but Mr. Bloomberg spent an obscene number of millions of dollars, and it's well recognized, sorry, you Republicans, but this is the fact, that he bought the office. And he's not the first politician who has bought an office. And with that office comes some authority. And that authority was acquired. So the question that we have to ask is, either earned authority or acquired authority, is it what we have that God has given us over Satan? And the answer is no. If it could be earned, it would no longer be by grace, and it would not be by the gift and the calling and purpose of God. It would be based upon works and human merit. If it could be bought, then everyone who had enough money or enough of whatever was acquired to get it would have it. So there must be a different kind of authority that we have. And that's where we move into an understanding of what is called delegated and conferred authority. Now, <clears throat> delegated and conferred authority are very different from the other two. What is delegated authority? Well, let's take a look at what we often refer to in this ministry, and you've heard this concept if you've listened to our teachings before, spiritual power of attorney. And I mention this so often, but there always are new people who haven't heard the concept, so it's very important that you understand it. It's when you delegate or allow someone else to act in your behalf. Of course, this is often done in the business world as a legal transaction. A document is drawn up, which is called a power of attorney. And anyone who has that document can act on your behalf. And the illustration that I often use is that of the recent death of my father. And it illustrates it in a very extreme way. The doctors came to me as my father was in the terminal stages of his life. And they said the life systems in him are shutting down. Now, we have a choice. We can intervene with extraordinary measures... We can put in feeding tubes. We can continue IV. But the fact is, it will only intensify his suffering. It will not stop the inevitable. So your choice is between keeping him around for a while and watching him suffer more or letting him go sooner. What would you like to do? So I made the choice not to heroically intervene, not to put my father through any more suffering. He was ready to meet the Lord. He was almost 94. He lived a good full life. It was time for him to go home. And so I signed a document and I authorized the doctors to remove, for example, the IV. Now the IV was helping to keep him alive. But because his systems were shutting down, there would be increased fluid retention which would cause greater pain. I made the decision to let him go. But the point is, I made the decision. He didn't make it. You know why? Because he signed a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper, he said, I grant full rights of power of attorney to my son. My father could not speak life or death over himself. I could speak it for him because he delegated that right to me. Now, there are certain instances in which we have delegated authority by Jesus Christ himself. Now, let's talk for a moment about conferred authority and we'll bring the two of them together. What is conferred authority? Well, one of the differences is, 
in the example of delegated authority, think in terms of the Great Commission. We are ambassadors for Christ. And what is the scripture? We beseech you in Christ's stead, as it says in the King James Version, or in his place, be reconciled to him. So the act of reconciliation to God is given to us. We are ambassadors. We are delegated to carry the gospel. Now what's interesting about that is that God never delegated an angel. He only delegates human beings. That's a powerful responsibility. There are times I wish he would have given it to an angel to do. But he didn't. He gave it to us. Now, when he gave the Great Commission, when he sent out the two, the twelve, and the seventy, and he said, preach the gospel, what did he also say? And the first sign, the first proof, the first evidence of the gospel will be what? You will cast out demons. So, the commission or the calling, the directive to cast out demons is delegated authority. We act under the principle of spiritual power of attorney. When we cast out demons, we are functioning under delegated authority. We are acting in the place of Christ. That's why when you tell a demon to leave, you tell them to leave how? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ's name, I command you to go. You don't say, in Bob Larson's name, I command you to go. Do you? You don't say, in Hank's name, I command you to go. In Lynn's name, I command you to go. You don't say in Angela's name, I command you to go. You don't say in Carolyn's name, I command you to go. You say in Jesus' name. That is delegated authority. That's an ambassador. In government, an ambassador speaks for the head of state. And whatever the ambassador of that country enters into, be it a treaty, an alliance, any type of business or military relationship, it is binding on both governments if the ambassador has signed off on it. Why is that? Because the ambassador has power of attorney. The ambassador has delegated authority. So when you face down the devil, he needs to know that you know God has delegated to you the right and responsibility to deal with that demon. Now that may not seem terribly profound to some of you, but to the rest of the body of Christ, <laughs> to folks who have never cast out a demon, who are not even sure that we should, this is revolutionary theology, folks. This is radical theology that any child of God has been delegated to do that. As I often say when people ask me the question, could every Christian cast out a demon? I say, all can, all should, not all would, nor will they. Everyone in this room can cast out demons. Everyone in this room should cast out demons. Not all of you will cast out demons. Some of you just will not take up the power of attorney and do it. But you need to know that you can and you should. Now, some of you just may not feel aptitudinally suited for it. Your personality, the circumstances may not present themselves. But you know what I believe? If you make yourself available, you'd be amazed what will happen. Some of you know the story of how I got involved in casting out demons. You don't know the story? Never heard the story? Well, I'll tell you. Because I think it's important to illustrate this principle. <clears throat> How has this ministry been raised up? And keep in mind, this now is a ministry which through the national and international media has carried the message of exorcism to more millions of people probably than all of church history. 
And now there are scores and scores of do what Jesus did teams all over America, Canada, around the world. And there are thousands of people doing what I did because I did what Jesus did. And they now are casting out demons. And I want to tell you, and do what Jesus did, there are some mighty warriors. Amen? Who do extraordinary exploits for God. But that would not have happened if I had not cast out my first demon. This ministry would not have been raised up. So how did that happen? Well, as a young man not yet in the ministry, I decided I wanted to see the world. Raised on a farm in Nebraska, you'd like to see what's on the other side of the globe. So when I bought a round-the-world trip ticket, now in those days, don't ask how many years it was, you could buy for $1,300 in Pan Am. Does anybody remember Pan Am? <laughs> Pan American Airways, the global airline, for $1,300 and around the world trip ticket, unlimited stops. Go anywhere, do anything, $1,300. Does this sound like a good time for a young single guy who wants to see the world? So I took off. For several months, I traveled the globe. So... I landed in Asia, and in each city, you, know, you just go from one city to the next. You had those kind of tickets in those days, unlimited stops. You go to one city, and you just stop. And I'd stay there for a while, and when I got tired of that place, I'd move on to another one. So there I was in Asia, and in India, and in places where there is more overt demonism. You know, our demons in America are much more sophisticated. <laughs> we give them PhDs in America. And we give them tenure. <laughs> but in, um, in many Eastern societies whose history is an idolatry, demonism is very much out in the open. You talk to those people about the spirit world, and it's no problem. They believe the spirit world and angels and demons exist. They have a different cosmology of theology about what that all means, but they do believe them. So I was at a, a Hindu self-mutilation and torture ritual perfectly normal thing for me to attend. I was interested. I wanted to see what went on. So I was watching these people torture themselves, and they did indeed torture themselves. Uh, they'd take three-foot skewers, uh, sharp as a pin, these steel skewers, and they'd stick one in one cheek and push it on through and stick it out out the other side, and, and then they'd take a, a knife and extend their tongue and pierce it vertically and leave the knife in so the tongue could not be retracted. They took... Um, oh, several hundred fish hooks, and they'd put them into their chest, and then they would hang objects from them to rip and to tear at the flesh, and then they'd take spike shoes with the nails pointed upwards, strap them onto their feet. They would take knives and flail at their body. Some of them would take huge meat hooks and put them into their muscles of their back, and they would then pull an idol, and they would go three miles in that condition. But the interesting thing was, in the hundreds of people that I saw tortured in this fashion, there was never a single drop of bloodshed. Never. Not a single drop of blood. And I saw hundreds of people go through this. So here I am, you know, this fresh-faced kid from the farm in Nebraska, and I'm watching all of this, all right? I don't have an understanding of demons and the devil. I don't know anything about exorcism. And at that point in time, I mean, there wasn't a lot of knowledge. I mean, there weren't books that you could read if you wanted to read them. So I'm watching all of this, and I would say to them, well, why don't you bleed? And the answer was always the same. Our God does this to show his power. Now, I think you understand the antithesis of Satan's gospel. It is a, in this case, bloodless gospel. That our forgiveness is by the shedding of sins. His is by not preventing them to bleed in this particular instance. And then I watched. Well, what is significant about what these people endure? How do they get into the state where they will enter into these rituals, and it was always the same. There would be a ceremony, and the priest would come up with some holy ash, and he would touch them in the center of the forehead, the psychic third eye, the sign of Shiva, and when he did that, almost instantly, their eyes would glass over, and they would go into seizures, foam with the mouth, scream, and then the other priest would have to get them under control, and they would start the torture process. And by the way, 
The torture process would last up to six to eight hours. They'd start early in the morning, would not finish until the afternoon. And they ended up at a different temple three miles away from the one where they started. And at the end of the temple, they would come back and touch them in the same spot on the forehead they would come to. And that person would not know a thing that happened. They would have no idea how they got three miles from one temple to another and why their body had all, this, all these puncture marks. No understanding. They were totally in a state of oblivion. Those of you who have been deliver through deliverance know what co-consciousness is. It means you're a little bit aware of what's going on. These guys know nothing. I mean, these are powerful trance states. So I watched all of this. And eventually I came back to America. And I said, Lord, I don't have a clue if this goes on in America. But if it does, I'm available. You all know what kind of a dangerous prayer Lord, I'm available is? That's sort of open-ended. Here I am, God, send me. That was it. Now, the very next day, somebody walked up to me and manifested a demon. Not. No, it didn't happen that way. In fact, it was three years after that before I met my first demon. Have you heard that story? Haven't heard that story? Well, three years later. Now I'm in the ministry, sort of. Not full time. I'm just taking speaking engagements to share my testimony. So I'm at a nice, polite, quiet Youth for Christ rally. What could be more benign than a Youth for Billy Graham Youth for Christ rally? They don't do demons. Right? Right. I didn't know that I did. They didn't. So here I am. I am not yet. The Exorcist. Okay, I'm just Bob sharing his testimony, playing his guitar, and talking about Jesus. So I speak at this Use for Christ rally. The rally's over with. I'm all done. I'm getting ready to, to walk away, and this saucy little 15-year-old girl walks up to me. And she says, I don't believe in your God. I said, okay. Okay. I said, do you believe in the devil? She said, yes. And her eyes lit up. Well, I said, why don't you believe in God and you believe in the devil? And she said, because I have sex with the devil. Now, mind you, this is sort of post-Rosemary's baby day, okay? So I'm thinking, this kid has seen one too many horror movies. <laughs> and I just tried to, you know... Shove her away. She said, no, you don't understand. I have sex with the devil. Now, at that point in time, I had never heard of something called incubus or spirits with sexually cohabit with humans. Remember, <laughs> I'm just fresh-faced kid off the farm in Nebraska. I don't know anything about demons. I don't do demons. And now this girl's telling me she has sex with one. And I think she's crazy. But something in me says, find out. You know, that's a line you cross over. You know, right? Most preachers are like out the back door at that point. <laughs> right behind the deacons. <laughs> and, I, and I'm standing there saying, okay, so if you have sex with the devil, I want to talk to the devil. I guess I've always kind of been that way. That's just sort of me. Now you know why I'm as aggressive, aggressive as I am. So I said to the Youth for Christ director, come on, let's go talk to this girl. Now, I did not know at the time that this Youth for Christ director on the stealth had actually run into a couple of cases of demons. Now, that was not something you talked about at Youth for Christ rallies. You didn't then. You don't now. But we did that. We took this gal into a side room, sat down with her. Now, here's a 15-year-old girl from rural Missouri. When I said, I want to talk to the demon that has sex with you, she sat up straight and suddenly began to speak in a very clipped crisp, refined Queen's English British accent. This blew me away. For the next five hours, this gal talks in this crisp British accent. I have her. I own her. Her body belongs to me. I make love to her. She is mine. You can't have her. That was my first exorcism. Unfortunately, this brother from Youth for Christ was there with me, and when I didn't know what I was doing, he tried to tell me what to do, and he wasn't sure what to do, but eventually I made my way through it. All because I said, I'm available. 
How many of you are available in this room? Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> well, no, no, do. How many of you are available in this room, huh? You should have seen this gal here. She, she's got her hands like this, and this one hand went. <laughs> the sort of conditional availability. <laughs> I made myself available. And I began to walk in the authority which Christ had delegated to me. Let's talk about conferred authority. What is conferred authority? Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 14. Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said to them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said, you are blessed. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I give you the keys, and whatsoever you bind will be bound on earth. It will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now what did he do to Peter at that point? He conferred upon Peter the authority to bind and to loose. Amen? And in Matthew 18, verses 18 to 19, we see this enunciated again. Whatsoever you bind will be bound, whatsoever you loose will be loosed, and if two or more agree, it shall be done. So conferred authority is not something that we deserve. It is something that by unmerited grace, God confers upon us. You know, every year in the springtime, you get all these Famous people speaking at universities. And they haven't done much of anything important for humanity except maybe make a few people laugh or played a starring role in some film. But suddenly they are Dr. Somebody. Right? They get an honorary doctorate. How many of you know most preachers who have one of those don't really have a theological seminary degree? They just know the right person and the right person gave them an honorary hip pocket certificate. And it was conferred. Now, I'm not ridiculing it. I just find it a little humorous because immediately they want to be called doctor. Well, okay, I'm Bob. I'm just happy with plain old Bob, okay? <laughs> I had somebody the other day who wanted to call me doctor. Some places they want to call me pastor. Just, just Bob will do. Just plain old Bob. I like that, okay? And I'm not putting anybody down who likes titles, but sometimes titles are just there because somebody converted. And honestly, if somebody has genuinely uh, done something that's a great contribution to humanity or to the church, I don't have a problem with them walking under the authority of a conferred doctorate. That's okay. That's all right. But you have to understand that this is not something that's there because you did something to get it. Now, this is what's critical. Because you know what? There isn't a single person in this room, especially me, who deserves the authority to cast out demons. You don't believe it, just ask my wife. That's humor, folks. That's humor. I hope you take that humorously. <laughs> That was intended tongue-in-cheek. You were afraid to laugh at that, I know. I do not deserve the authority that I have. And you don't either. I said, you don't either. None of us deserve it. None of us have earned it. Because if we did earn it, we give away the right almost every single day by something we do that we shouldn't. But when it's conferred upon you, you've got it. And when you said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be my personal Lord and Savior, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, born of a virgin, raised from the dead, and alive forevermore, you got it. Oh, thank you for that unbridled enthusiasm. I said, you got it. Come on, say amen and give the Lord a hand. You got it. Amen? Amen? Now, when do you lose it? 
Who said never? Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Sure? Yes. Okay, good. I just thought I'd see if I could intimidate you a little bit and back you down. You're right. You don't ever lose it. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now, some people misuse the gifts and calling of God. Some people abuse the gifts and calling of God. We've all seen examples of that. If you haven't, stick around the body of Christ for a while. You will see it. It happens. It's unfortunate. But it's without repentance. It doesn't ever get taken back. Now, power, as we talked about in the previous session, that's different. The power can come. The power can go. You don't believe it? Just ask Samson. He rose up, he shook himself, and guess what? The power was gone. He was shorn. You can lose the power. You can't lose the gift that's conferred upon you. Now, that's important to know. Because sometimes when you're trying to take on the devil, you don't feel like taking on the devil. Amen? Amen? Sometimes when you're trying to stare the devil down, the devil reminds you of your past. You remind him not where you've been, but where he's headed. Sometimes the devil will try to throw a guilt trip. He'll try to get you into self-condemnation. And more than once, I've had to say to the devil, Satan, I don't feel much like I deserve the authority, but back off because it's mine Jesus gave it to me, and it doesn't matter how I feel today. Because you know what? Sometimes I don't feel like being the exorcist. Amen, Scott? There are days, I'm sure some of you do what Jesus did, teen people, me to minister deliverance, and you don't feel like ministering deliverance. You just don't have it in you. Does that mean you shouldn't do it? No, because some of the greatest miracles I've seen and been in conferences when I walked out there and I didn't feel like the exorcist. I felt like nothing. But it was the power of God in me and it was the calling and the conferred authority Christ gave in me to me that I walked in and God still used me. And it illustrated to me even more. Now, Peter's the perfect example of this, folks. Now, right here, Peter gets divine revelation. The other 11 guys are standing over there. They don't have a clue who he is. They're not sure. Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Now, here were these godly disciples of Jesus buying into Greek philosophy of reincarnation. Yes. They're buying into Greek philosophy. They're thinking, well, you know, maybe... Maybe Elijah came back. Maybe this is another lifetime. Maybe the spirit of somebody else is in him. Peter, good old Peter, a rascal Peter. The most unpredictable of all. He is the one who got revelation. Flesh and blood didn't show this to you. My father showed it to you. Supernaturally, it was revealed to you, Peter. Now, you all know what happened just a few verses later. Jesus talks about going to the cross. Peter tries to talk him out of it. Jesus looks at him and he says, Get behind me, Satan. Boy, how, how, how fast can we get out of the spirit into the flesh? Amen? How fast can we get out from under the anointing into sin? Amen? How fast can we get out from under this authority that's conferred upon us to act like we don't deserve it? Now, question. Did Peter have a demon? I don't know. Was Peter demon possessed? You know we don't use those terms. I don't know. I do know this. The devil spoke through Peter. Peter spoke the words of Satan. What he said was what the devil wanted him to say. And the Bible says clearly, Jesus looked at Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. He looked at Peter, looked him in the eye, just like I've done with some of you, and said, get out of here, Satan. The devil was somehow, someway, somewhere in, around, on top of, underneath, influencing, intruding, tormenting, harassing, affecting Peter. 
Suppose it's possible it could happen to you. Anybody had revelation like Peter yet? I haven't. If you can get revelation one minute and the devil talk to you the next, there's hope for every one of you. There's hope for every one of you. But my point is this. Did the authority conferred upon him by Christ leave? No. In fact, a little later, we all know what's happened. The, co the cock is crowing, and guess what's happened by then? Three times he said, I don't know the man, and he said it with vulgarities, profanities, and my guess is he took God's name in vain when he did it. Did the authority leave him? No. Now, I'm certainly not suggesting aberrant, sinful, fleshly, ungodly behavior just to prove you've still got the authority. But what I am trying to get across to you, and this is what the devil doesn't want you to know, is that the authority is not about who you are. It's about who he is. Amen? It's not about who you are. It's about who he is. It's not about how you feel today, but what he did yesterday, today and forever. It's not about your merit, your works, your good intentions. It's about what he did at the cross 2,000 years ago when he defeated the devil and rose again from the dead. And he said, I have all authority. The keys to the kingdom are mine. The keys to hell, death, and the grave are in my hands. Amen. amen. Come on, amen. Give the Lord a hand. Get a little excited here. So, this is our authority. This is what we walk in. Forget about how you feel. Forget about where your emotions are. Forget about how you kicked the cat. <laughs> Whatever you did that made you feel not spiritual, you know what? There are times, folks, when I have to walk out and stare those demons down and I've got to do some repenting. I've got to ask the Lord to forgive me for fleshly thoughts, feelings, desires, emotions that have crept in on me during the day. Is that too difficult an admission for you to accept from a man of God? Huh? You know what? We need a little more of that in the pulpit, don't we? We need a few more people walking to the pulpit and saying, I don't deserve to be here today, but by God's grace, I've got the authority to be here. Amen? Amen. And if more people in the pew would hear that, they would understand that we've all got feet of clay. I'm trying to get across to you that you all can stare down the devil. You can all take on demons in your family, among your friends. Start walking in that authority. Quit letting the devil say to you, you don't know enough. You're not smart enough. You didn't go to Bible school. You're not prepared for this. Look what you did yesterday. Look what you did this morning. You say, Satan, the authority, the authority is mine. God has never called it back. It's never been relinquished. I've got it. And I repent immediately of what I did yesterday, today, and five minutes ago. And now, Satan, stick your head up, and I'm going to chop it off. And some of the most powerful exorcisms I ever, have ever done have been when I felt the least like doing it. And I remember in some of the early stages of doing deliverance, and the devil's kind of given up on this one. He would try to throw things up. He would bring up things about me and my past. Things that I knew nobody else knew. And he knew it because he'd been watching. And I'd be hesitant and I'd start to back off. And I'd have to remember the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood covers it. It's over with. It's done. I am forgiven of the sins I did yesterday, today, and tomorrow as long as I lay claim to it. And Satan, you will back down. So I've wanted to so strongly emphasize to you that this is honorary. It's conferred. Put on your mortar board. You've got it. Put the certificate on the wall that says, I have hereby been granted the authority by the judge of all humanity, the king of heaven, to have authority over demons and the devil. Amen? And he has delegated me 
and told me as his ambassador to go out and do it. Amen. Amen. Now look, folks, you can graduate, get the certificate, have conferred upon you the right to practice until you hang up your shingle and make yourself available. It's not going to do anybody any good. You can spend eight years in residency and medical school and become a brain surgeon. But you know what? If you don't stick the certificate on the wall, put your name on the door and open the door for business and join a hospital staff, you will never do brain surgery. Doesn't make any difference what's been conferred upon you unless you walk in the delegation and go out and do it as the ambassador or the one who represents those who have conferred upon you the right to do it, nobody is going to have brain surgery. Nobody's going to be helped. Take the authority. It's been delegated to you. Go out and do it. Now let's talk about two aspects of that authority that are very critical to understand. Amen? Isn't this fun? I'm having fun, aren't you? Amen? Very quickly. Let's talk about limited and unlimited authority. Uh, well, that's sort of what I was doing. That's sort of what I was doing. I didn't really make that point succinctly, but yes, it is delegated by the Holy Spirit. That's right. Uh, let me just touch on that. The gentleman does raise a good point. The delegated authority is only effectual when it is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the previous session, I tried to make that point to you, but let's underscore it again. You will see, receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So the ambassadorship that you have is based upon the filling of the Holy Spirit on your life. And the ability to walk in delegated authority requires the Holy Spirit. Yes, good point, and I'm glad that you reminded me that we hadn't covered that. Now, let's talk about the difference between limited and unlimited authority. All right? You. Do you have limited or unlimited authority? Not sure what to say. Somebody says unlimited. Somebody else is not too sure. All right, Jesus. Did Jesus have limited or unlimited authority? How many think you had limited authority? How many think Jesus had absolutely unlimited authority? Absolutely unlimited authority. Thank you. God bless you. You're all wrong. Jesus did not have unlimited authority. Let's talk, hold it. Let's talk about why Jesus did not have absolute unlimited authority, all right? Did Jesus have total, complete, unlimited authority? Let's, let's take a look, first of all, at an instance in which Jesus walked in authority. And turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Mark, the second chapter, all right? Mark, the second chapter. Starts out saying he entered Capernaum and it was heard that he was in the house. Man, I love it when Jesus is in the house. Amen? Some people are worried when Elvis leaves the house. I'm worried when Jesus leaves the house. All right? And you know what happened in uh, Mark chapter 2? They brought the paralytic to him, and they couldn't get to him, so they ripped off the roof, and they let him down through the roof. Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and they reasoned in their heart, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Duh. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> Don't you guys get it? Yeah? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Dummies, scribes, he's God. That's why he's doing it. They just didn't get it, did they? Now, when Jesus forgave the man's sins. Which was it? Limited or unlimited authority? And which was it delegated or conferred authority? Delegated or conferred when he forgave the man's sins? It was conferred. Why was it conferred? Because it was given to him by the Father. The 
Father conferred on him the authority to forgive sin. That is what freaked out the scribes. They could not deal with that. Because there is only one way you could have conferred authority to forgive sin. You had to be God. They knew that. Now, you and I do not have that conferred authority. We cannot forgive sins. That is not conferred upon that. That was conferred alone on Jesus. All right, follow with me. Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves. He said, why do you reason these things in your heart? Which is easier to say that the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, get up, take your bed, and walk. But so that you might know the Son of God has power on earth to forgive sins, or it should say authority. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise up, take your bed, go to your house. Now he healed the man. He got up and walked away. How did he heal him? Through conferred or delegated authority. How many of you think it was through conferred authority? Come on, now you've got to vote. You've got to vote. How many of you think, well, I'm going to show you up now if you don't raise your hands in this one. How many of you think it was delegated authority? Ah, you're catching on. It was delegated authority. It was delegated authority. Because delegated authority is limited authority. Conferred authority is unlimited authority. Now stay with me. This is very important to understand. You say, Bob, you're really getting picky. No, it's important to understand these technicalities. Because over the next couple of days, you're going to see where we go with this. And when we get there, all these legal technicalities are going to become very important to understand what you can and cannot do in the spirit realm. Now, the ability to forgive sins was conferred. The ability to heal was delegated. Why do I consider it to be delegated? You and I cannot forgive sins, but we can heal. And he told us to do it. He delegated us to do it. Lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So Jesus delegated to us the authority. James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another, you will be healed. Call the elders of the church together, anoint them with oil, pray over them in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall raise up the sick. So that's delegated authority. It's important to understand the distinction. We are ambassadors at that point, And Jesus was operating in the same power of the Spirit that we have available to us to cast out demons and to heal the sick. That's delegated authority. When you pray for the sick, when you cast out demons... It's because you've been delegated to do so and the authority has been conferred upon you to speak in his name. All right, now, I asked you a question. Did Jesus have limited or unlimited authority? So, let's ask that question again. Limited or unlimited authority? You're right, he had both. He had unlimited authority to forgive sin. But he had limited authority to heal. Now, this is where I have to part ways with some folks who believe that everybody you pray for, if you have enough faith, will be healed. That's simply not true. Oh, I can see the Pentecostals are getting upset. <laughs> Matthew 13. Came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed. He came to his own country. He taught in the synagogue. They were astonished. Where did this guy get these wisdom, this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this the carpenter's son? Mary's his mother. His brother James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, his sisters, aren't they all with us? When did this man get these things? And they were offended. Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own house. Now, he did not do mighty works there because of their unbelief. So,
people come to me all the time and say, well, can't you just tell those demons to go and make them go? If you were a man of God, I don't see why you have to struggle with those demons. Why? Well, Brother so-and-so I know, he just casts those demons out. He tells them to go and they go in the name of Jesus. And then they come right back. Why can't you make them go? Why do you have to struggle? Why do you have to wrestle with them? I hear you tell these stories. Sometimes you work with people for hours, days, weeks, months, sometimes years to get all the demons out of these people. If you had the power of God, they would go. Folks, there's a lot going on in an exorcism that's below the radar screen that you may not see. And it sometimes is a process. And sometimes part of that process is the person's unbelief. They're not yet ready to receive their freedom. They want it, but they may not yet truly believe who they are in Christ and that they can be free. Now, I can shout at the devil all I want to. I can scream and yell and tell him to go to hell until I'm blue in the face. They're not going anywhere if that person isn't ready to receive their freedom. Jesus could not do miracles in a place where people didn't believe. He had very limited authority. With me? So don't be intimidated if you're trying to work for someone to get deliverance for them. And this is not to put the onus on them and to make them feel badly. Some people have a struggle with believing for their freedom because they're so beaten up. And for those of you in this room who are struggling to get your freedom, hey, I'm not picking on you and saying, it's your fault. No, 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 no. You don't have enough faith. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I understand why you don't have the faith. And what I want to do is encourage you to have the faith. I want to help you to build you up. Amen? I want to stay with you, work with you, walk with you until you've got your faith to be free. But you know what? They don't always have it right at the beginning, do they? And you come up against those demons and they'll just laugh in your face. They're not going anywhere. And I've had them say to me, she doesn't really believe who she is in Christ. She doesn't really believe that she can be free. She thinks she's always going to be like this. She thinks it'll never really be any different. And as long as she believes that, I can stay here. So people think that exorcism is simply a matter of the power. Got enough power? Get the job done. Not true at all. No more than it's true with healing or any other miracle of God. We are partners in this process. And everybody's got to be walking in the faith. So this afternoon, I want to encourage you. I'm not here to beat up on you. I'm not here to say, ah, you don't have enough faith. I'm here to say, I want to help you to receive more faith. I want to help you to grow in that gift God has given you so you can believe God for your freedom. So, sometimes it is limited. Now, there are a couple of other areas in which moral and which authority is limited. There are two ways it's limited. There is moral limitation. There are some things you just can't do because it's just not right to do them. But the most important restraint, the most important mitigation to absolute authority is the one I want to talk about next. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans 13. It's very critical. Romans 13. What is the most significant limitation to complete, absolute, unmitigated authority? Now, if your Bibles, I want you also to turn to 1 Peter 2. We're going to look at those two passages of Scripture because here is where it is detailed. Authority is not totally absolutely applicable in all circumstances because of some very practical limitations. Romans 13. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. 
Therefore, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be afraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. Authority is limited by civil restraint. There are areas where you would like to have authority, you can't have authority. That authority has been precluded. You just can't do it, you just can't have it. 1 Peter 2. Verse 13, therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme or to governors, as to those who have been sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God, honor all people of the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Civil restraint. Limits authority. I return to the illustration given earlier. The parent with a 19-year-old child living in a state of spiritual rebellion, curses upon his life. The parents desiring to break those curses cannot because civil authority has declared he is enfranchised with the moral capacity, the volition to choose for himself. Reach your children while you can. Many parents will come to me and say, I've just discovered this business about generational curses. There are a ton of them in my family. I want to break them over my grandchildren and my children. Agree with me in prayer. I will break those curses. And my first question is, how old is your child? If your child is 18 years of age or older, you have the power of effectual prayer. You do not have the absolute authority to break the curse. So if a curse came upon you, it's already passed on to them, and you can't stop it. They have to stop it. But my grandkids, your kids have to stop the curse of your grandkids. You can't. You could have before civil authority said, sorry, they're beyond your jurisdiction now. They're on their own. Get to your children while you can. Reach them while there is still time. This is not to discourage you. This is to encourage you to do more than you've ever done. To make sure that your family is raised in the fear and the knowledge of God. And I'll tell you what's heartbreaking, and the devil plays it to the hilt. And that's a situation where a family has curses and doesn't know that they have curses. And finds out too late to do anything about it. This is why the church and the body of Christ has got to start preaching this truth. Do you understand me? There are people suffering in the pew today because some preacher, some teacher could have, should have told them what they might have done and didn't do it. And now those people suffer because that preacher, pastor, teacher didn't want anything to do with deliverance. Didn't want to know about this stuff. And the declarations of deliverance that could have been made were never made. And now a lot of people suffer. Bottom line. Bottom line. Four kinds of authority. The two that are critical to us are conferred authority and delegated authority. Know which it is. Walk in it. Apply it, but understand there are cases in which it will be limited by unbelief and the moral or spiritual restraint of those to whom you minister, and that there will be instances of civil restraint when though the authority is absolute, its application will not be possible because of those 
mitigating circumstances. Know the authority. Use the authority. And know where you can and cannot apply the authority. The International School of Exorcism, an online Bible college of spiritual warfare. The history of exorcism, healing, deliverance, and spiritual warfare. The practical aspects of breaking curses, pulling down spiritual strongholds, and removing the legal rights of Satan. Set yourself, your friends, and family free by enrolling in the International School of Exorcism. In our new book, Set Your Family Free, we teach how to raise children with purity principles, how to prepare them for adulthood, and how to break every assignment of Satan over their lives. We give you the principles of spiritual warfare to fight for your family and to be victorious over the powers of darkness. This is the book that will set your family free. How do you know if your problems are the result of bad life choices or demons. My 200 page book dealing with demons has answers for questions most are afraid to ask. Can Christians be demon possessed? How can I know what's natural and what's supernatural? Dealing with demons will teach you how to recognize symptoms that the devil is at work in your life. Be one step closer to living in spiritual victory. The most frequent demon that I deal with is the spirit of Jezebel. This demon wants to destroy your health, your finances, your marriage, your family, and your church. My book, Jezebel, is your key to overcoming the most prevalent evil spirit of our age. Get your copy today. He took the curses away from me. We'll see Papa Larson because he can help you. If your life isn't all that it should be, if relationships aren't working, if your health, your finances, or your spiritual life are unhappy, schedule a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter with me. We'll get to the root of the issues that are holding you back. We'll give you answers and a whole new direction in life. Oh, what a change, what a difference when you have an encounter with God. Take action. I look forward to seeing you soon. your support for this worldwide outreach to do what Jesus did. For the latest information on resources, seminars, conferences, training institutes, retreats, and international missions, go to boblarson.org. Thank you for your prayers and financial partnership.